Hi there, me, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke consultant. So we're going to continue on with the caregiver, uh, spouse, partner, burnout, uh, or self-care uh, series. This is number four. This one's specifically going to be about burnout. And because of some of the research I've done for this video, it's going to turn into a fifth one as well. So let's just talk about burnout. So the stroke occurs suddenly. For all of us that have had a stroke, or for, for those of us that are supporting a loved one or know of someone that's had a stroke, it's a rather sudden affair. You go from stumbling through your world to in an ambulance to a hospital bed. And it's by far and large, then there will be exceptions to this. A stroke is in a significantly rapid onset event. It's just like you're, I was at work standing, having a conversation and within a minute and a half, I was on the floor, unable to help myself. So with the vast majority of stroke folk will eventually be discharged home, the stroke family caregivers, they report feelings of uncertainty, emotional distress, and the need for more training and, and information on how to deal with their impacted loved one. Right? So we're going to discuss burnout. Because many of the, the, the familial caregivers and, and friends that are caregivers, they feel drastically unprepared and unready. Because, again, you can't really prepare yourself for a stroke, be it the stroke folk or the caregivers they're in. Right? Um, you can prepare yourself for a car accident, so to speak, but you can't really prepare yourself for the outcome of the car accident. Stroke, you're never ready for this. So let's just talk about burnout. So caregiver burnout can lead to a drastic and significant decline in the caregiver's quality of life. And then because their quality of life gets diminished, it also impacts the quality of care that they're able to provide to the stroke survivor themselves. Six months after the stroke, 37% of caregivers report experiencing considerable strain. And again, I've done research for this video. There's links down below to all the research I've done. So if there's anything you want to double check me on, you can easily go check the links. The articles as of the posting of this video are still available. So you can definitely find the information that I've used, right? Now, this strain is a combination of the time they help spending care for the care, uh, the care of the, the, the stroke survivor themselves, in addition to um, the strain on their own life, right? Uh, now, the strain in a couple of ways, because one, you now have to set aside what you were initially going to do that day for you, for the family, for whatever, and you now have to dedicate that time to the stroke survivor. So you get some of that, you now have to juggle, plan, time management, you know, you've got to do more of an appreciation of what you intend to accomplish that day and have more of an agenda. And I'm going to be honest, there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability in stroke and, and stroke recovery. So what you might have intended to accomplish in one day can be quickly and, and drastically undone. And, and that's not anyone's fault. That's just the byproduct of a stroke. Okay. So now because of something I read in one of the articles I was using for research, I'm going to do a fifth video specifically on the mental health of caregivers because there is a high incidence um, of mental health concerns, not only in the stroke patient or the stroke survivor, but the caregivers they're in. So I'm going to do a fifth video specifically on mental health concerns with um, caregivers the, and the, the supporters of people that are going through a stroke. Right. Now one study indicated that some of the research some of the some of the priorities that research has drawn out that caregivers have uh, in regards to the, the concerns they specifically have about their loved ones is their cognition. How well do they think? Aphasia, communication issues. So I have aphasia and I've done some videos on aphasia, and I'm going to leave the links down below about my videos on aphasia. Um, so 
I'm going to expand aphasia to be communication issues because there's many different forms of communication issues, many different forms of aphasia. So depending on how drastically your communication abilities are impacted and depending on what communication abilities are impacted can definitively change that caregiver relationship. Uh, as I've said before, my grandmother had a, a, a fairly massive stroke um, and it drastically impacted her communication ability. I've seen what that looks like when you have a loved one who's basically their communication center appears to be wiped out um, or highly compromised. Vision issues. So if you've had a stroke, your, your vision may have been impacted. I do have some vision issues after my stroke. Predominantly, it's when I go out in the world and under fluorescent lights or certain types of um, harsh lighting, they can definitely impact uh, my quality of life. But what if you're left with low vision, limited vision, legally blind, right? That now places a new level of complexity. Um, I'm, I'm trying not to use the word burden, but complexities on the, um, the caregivers, right? Because if you now have to take into account that your loved one is, now has low vision or is now technically legally blind, uh, that's going to place some new challenges in your way. Upper limb functioning, right? So the ability to use your arms and uh, your head, your neck, your shoulders, there's a lot of things that if you don't have those abilities that, that you as an individual, you lose some self-sufficiencies. Like if you can't move your hands effectively, you can't really feed yourself, right? Uh, if you can't move your arms effectively, you can't steady yourself. Uh, if you can't you know, do many things with your hands. Can you put on a belt? Can you tie your own shoes? Can you cut your own food? Can you feed yourself? So not having effective upper limb functionality can can definitely be a serious a serious thing about how much time you need to take to care for that person. Because if you can't use your arms properly, you can't lift yourself off a of bed. Right? So now you need to look at things such as um, do you need to invest in or find funding for some type of uh, bed transfer system, right? Uh, if you can't use your upper limbs, you can't wash yourself, right? General mobility, right? What if the stroke has left you with some significant mobility issues up, up to and including paralysis? Well, if you're now in a wheelchair, uh, that again places some new challenges on the people that are gonna help to care for you. Because now they have to look at things like, do we need to move your bedroom downstairs? Because, you know, it's not practical to have it upstairs. Do we need to get a special wheelchair? Do we need to get a scooter? Do we need, do, do we need to buy a new vehicle? Do we need to get ramps? Right? So there's, there's a lot of things when you get into the mobility issues. Fatigue. I've done a couple of videos on fatigue after stroke. Fatigue can be... I'm going to be honest. Neurological fatigue and... and, and after a stroke can all, almost be a disability on its own. Because what I'm able to do today, I may not be able to do tomorrow. Um, the fatigue may last a day and a half to three days. The fatigue may last an hour and a half. The fatigue may have other factors involved in this. The fatigue could trigger a headache. Um, you know, so there's a lot of things to do with fatigue that people go, well, you just might be tired. Well, it's a different kind of tired. Um, yeah, you, you are physically and mentally exhausted. And if, if you're that fatigued, that can genuinely impact your plans for the day, your social interactions, uh, if you're even getting out of bed that day, uh, how how much you're able to participate in just the normal administration of your household. So are you able to go grocery shopping? Are you able to help do food prep? Are you able, you know, there's so many things with fatigue that can, can genuinely um, impact your quality of life. Next one, it's a, it's a bit of um, a subjective one, but coming to terms with long-term consequences. There are some significant long-term consequences that deal with stroke and stroke recovery, stroke rehabilitation and stroke reintegration, and just coming to terms with 
what those look like. You know, I've, I've done a video on radical acceptance. Uh, and in some cases, it is a matter of just accepting the fact that th th things have irrevocably changed. And for certain things, that's easy enough to accept. For other things, it's not. I mean, like, just think about it. You've had a stroke. Uh, now, I'm able to drive. I didn't lose my driver's license. But I'll be honest, if I had to drive in a situation where I'm unfamiliar with my surroundings, probably not a good idea. Um, I'm, I'm on a highway situation. I'm good for three to maybe four hours of driving. So if we need to do any significant traveling, I'm not good to do, well, as of right now anyways, as of right now, I might be able to drive a portion of that every day. But there's no way I would depend upon myself as, as being the significant um, driver. Right? That's not a reality. Uh, other long-term consequences you're dealing with is you may have um, a significant series of ongoing medical appointments. You now have to look at organizing your medication, uh, medication changes, how that might impact vacationing. Because if you've had a recent medication change, that might negate the ability to get traveler's insurance, which means you now might have to be more strategic about how you plan your vacations. Confidence. Having a stroke can strip you of your confidence. And it, it's got to be emotional turmoil for your loved ones to watch you have a, have a lack of confidence. It has to be disheartening for your loved ones to, to watch you have a lack of confidence. I know there are situations now that I just won't participate in because I, I don't feel confident in my own abilities uh, to navigate that situation. So I, I might be a bit more hesitant to do things depending on the situation. And I know that that can't be easy to watch. Next one is helping stroke survivors and their families cope with speech problems. Now, this is different than aphasia being a communication issue uh, because there are many kinds of aphasia. But I'm talking about dealing with the speech problems with, you know, anomia, where I'm having problems word finding and word selection. Uh, you're having problems with uh, aphasia, that being trying to get the thought out to my, my, uh, my mouth, right? I can think the words, but just actually making the completion of getting the statement out. And then occasionally when I start to stutter because of the apraxia, uh, that can't be pretty. And for some people, the deficits will slowly over time come back to the point where maybe two to three years after your stroke, you don't know or couldn't even tell that individual has speech deficits. However, in the initial phases of it, it can be pretty difficult to deal with. And then lastly, secondary consequences of the stroke and subsequent stroke prevention. There's a lot of secondary consequences of stroke. And I've done a bunch of videos on some of the deficits I have or other people may have had after a stroke. And I've also done another video about avoiding your, your next stroke or avoiding your second stroke. So those are the top 10 uh, research indicated priorities related to stroke impairments. So there, there's a lot to unpack there, especially for the caregivers, the spouses, partners, family members, close friends of the stroke survivor, because there's a lot of things in there that they're outside anyone's control. They're outside anyone's influence. A lot of these things may come back on their own, a lot of these things may come back with interventions, that being rehab and support. And some of them either will take time or may never come back. And that's just some of the realities of having a brain injury. Some of it may come back, some of it may not. And it gets back to that coping with the long-term consequences and just a bit of radical acceptance, just being able to accept what is and hoping for the better for what isn't. Now, during the first six months after your stroke, that's where some caregivers report the most strain. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, 
the immediacy of the stroke. Two, that's where most stroke survivors, they're going to need the most help. Three, it's the biggest period of transition that you're going to have. Be that supporting someone while they're in the hospital, supporting someone while they're being moving from one facility to another, or supporting someone when they first come home. Because at that point, you have to set, a, set aside specific time to provide the care, right? Uh, you've got to find a way to put that care into your schedule. So again, we get, we get into that whole time appreciation and an estimate of what you're going to be able to accomplish in that day. Where, is, where are you going to do this? Is it in the hospital, the home, or some other situation? And so on average, your, your average caregiver, and this is from a study that's listed in the link below, on average, your average caregiver in the first three months is providing about eight hours per day. Right? And at the 12 month, it was seven hours per day. Right? And that's informal care provided by, you know, people in the home. So that eight hours could be broken up with many activities. It doesn't really matter what those are. Right? So, and then lastly, we need to look at the severity of the stroke so mild strokes a lot of the recovery is going to be spontaneous um, caregivers after mild or moderate events um, they showed a significant satisfaction increase because things were getting better on their own and because of that they had a decrease in feeling like things were a burden or they weren't as helpful as they could be they also reported that you know education programs for caregivers uh, de decreased their sense of depression, uh, their sense of strain, and increased satisfaction levels uh, because they're able to get some help. Right? Severe patients, their brains are more damaged, so their deficits tend to be greater. And because people with severe stroke, and I've again with my grandmother, I have seen this. Someone who's had a severe stroke. Some of the goal um, orient, orientation therapies uh, may not be the most successful because the, the damage was so significant that might not be the best intervention strategy. People that have had a severe stroke uh, may benefit more from a sensory approached uh, occupational and physical rehabilitation program. And because persons that have had a severe stroke tend to show less improvement, sometimes with the caregivers, they can show less satisfaction simply because their loved ones hit a wall. And, and it's a wall that you can't immediately find a way around, over or under. And again, with my grandmother, I've, I've, I've seen what that looks like. And, and, it, and it's discouraging because she presented almost identical from about two weeks after her stroke to almost a year after her stroke. There was no significant improvement. She would have slightly better days here and there, but for looking for a, a trackable improvement, I'm just gonna be honest, there, there, there wasn't one. Right? So I've seen some of what a severe stroke can look like and myself have having had a moderate stroke so caregivers they can burn out because they're there for the day in the day out the tying of the shoes the helping with socks the cutting the food the making the meals the feeding the bathing the toileting the dressing right there's a lot of things going on there right and and we'll discuss a bit more of that in depth when we do the video part five about uh, caregiver depression or caregiver mental health issues and why they're having some of these issues. So if you happen to be someone who's supporting someone that's going through the recovery of a stroke or a brain injury, please watch this video. You're gonna get some benefit out of it. Or if you know someone that is caring someone for someone that's had a, a stroke, please point the video out to them. They'll definitely get some benefit out of it. 
or if you know of someone that is a stroke survivor themselves, please point the channel out to them. They'll get some benefit out of this. And if you happen to see either in yourself or someone around you the signs or symptoms of a stroke, that being someone appears to be befuddled, confused, or has lost your sense of balance, someone appears to have vision problems, someone has facial droop, someone who has the inability to raise both arms equally effectively or at all, someone who has uh, the inability to smile equally effectively or at all, uh, slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, has general body weakness, weakness on one side, or the inability to stand unaided, please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.